At the beginning of the story, a celebration is held at the Yakuza place in Todo, Tokyo, Japan. They welcome their criminal partners from Russia. The Yakuza leader gives a speech, inviting everyone to toast to this cooperation. Suddenly, two people outside fell, they were shot. Coincidentally, next to Toto's Yakuza place is a small bar. A girl named Sato Yoko was sitting with a masher who was bothering her. He thought this scantily clad girl would get drunk first. Yoko proceeded to drink with this guy, downing many glasses. He was getting more and more exhausted, but this guy was getting more and more insolent to Yoko. This guy was wrong to bother the girl, instead he got drunk first and was played by Yoko, who was to be very strong on drinking. Meanwhile, the Yakuza leader handed over a gift to his alley's gangster leader, telling him to try out the katana. The gangster leader swung the katana and suddenly there was a gun blast. The gangster leader fell, the atmosphere immediately panicked and one after another people fell. They tried to save their leader. This is the look of the mysterious assassin. His appearance was very strange with a black cloth mask. No bullet was wasted. Even one bullet could kill two people. No one was safe that night. This guy is fast with crazy gun skills. Accidentally, a Yakuza subordinate had recorded it with a cell phone. All shots were aimed at vital parts. Each assassin's bullet takes the lives of people and the Yakuza leader Goto dies. This assassin did not finish off his woman. Apparently, Yoko is a colleague of this assassin. She is the younger sister of an assassin named Sato Akira, and they left that place. Akira is a strange person. He really likes the comedy show hosted by comedian Jekyll Tomioka on TV. Even Akira sometimes laughs late. He thought Jekyll was very funny. Yoko felt strange about her brother because that guy wasn't funny at all. They reached the harbor. Akira Sato threw his bullet casings into the sea. From the countless numbers in the sea, who knows how many people this man had targeted. Akira and Yoko were already sitting with someone they called their boss and the master who trained the two brothers. Akira asked, when is the next job? The boss replied, temporary leave for a year and go into hiding. He gave two fake IDs to the sibling. They are going to Osaka. There is a local Yakuza gang of their boss acquaintance who will help them both. He has already arranged everything, so they must hide for a year and live life like an ordinary person. His boss gave him a yakitori bird for his pet to look like a normal person. Akira thought it would be fun. His boss warned him that if he took someone's life during his leave, he would chase him down by himself and finish them both off. Akira's tongue is very sensitive and when he wants to eat, he gets surprised and eats everything. Meanwhile, at Sato's Yakuza gang's place, two more assassins arrived. They only found dead bodies lying down around. One had the code name Hoodie and the other with the code Mukai. Hoodie was very sure the culprit could be the fable. Mukai thinks it's a joke because the fable is just a fairy tale legend and it's impossible. Then a woman of the Yakuza leader came out and was finished off by Hoodie. Hoodie invites his partner to find Fable. If they both defeat him, they will also become legends and famous. In another place, Akira started packing his things. His boss told him to put all the weapons in the microwave. He would pick them up later. Inside the radio was Akira's favorite weapon, a Beretta-type handgun. Akira decided to take his gun with him. On the way, Yoko asks if Akira speaks Osaka dialect Japanese. Akira answered with a little strange gesture while tapping his head. Suddenly, Akira's dialect immediately changed. Scene moved to Osaka Maguro Financial Company. Everyone immediately stood up to greet the director named Ebihara Takeshi. Actually, they were a gang of gangsters masquerading as a loan shark company. This was the supreme leader of their group named Amada. Takeshi had heard that he was assigned to help an assassin named Fable. Then Tankishi asked if they should do this, because the Fable is very dangerous person. Hamada replied, they have no choice. The man behind Fable is very dangerous and once helped his group. They will find a place for him to stay. Hamada warned, only the two of us know about this. Keep this a secret to the rest of the members. Tankishi feels that the timing isn't right, because a troublemaker will be released from prison. A man named Kojima will be free. He was a nephew of the leader of Hamada. 
a recidivist gangster who is very reckless and ruthless, really liked to finish people off. He is very happy to make trouble using the influence of the Maguro group in Osaka. Akira and Yoko arrive at the Maguro group's place. These two people were a bit skeptical seeing Akira and Yoko's appearance. They asked for proof. Is he really the legendary Akira Sato of the fable? They want to test him if he wants to eliminate himself and director Hamada, then show him how the fable did it. Akira moves, it was Takeshi hit a gun in his shirt. Takeshi asked again, but there were 10 more people outside. Akira replied that director Hamada was also carrying a second gun. Both men were amazed how he knew. Akira replied that he could smell the gun from afar. Yoko apologizes, her brother is not evil. The two are taken to the place where they will stay. There are two houses next to each other, fully equipped. They can use the rooms on the second floor as whatever they like, but there's a car in the garage. Take she asked them not to touch it. It's his favorite car. The man named Kuro welcoming Takechi, who is dizzy and heading for his car. He asks Kuro to do something. Akira goes to the roof, brings his bird and looks at the neighborhood he'll be living in for the next year. Akira is determined to try to live a normal life. He sits at the bar, helping his sister drink. Yoko warns her brother if she has a handsome boyfriend, so don't try to finish him off. When they return home, two thugs harass him. They say Akira insulted them with his stare. Akira tells his sister to go home first. Yoko, who was almost drunk, went home upset. She felt pity for the two thugs. These two people arrogantly wanted to beat her up. But Akira actually allowed himself to be beaten and acted weak and in pain. But actually when he was beaten on the head, he broke the fingers of these two thugs' hands. Akira even pretended to act like he was crying in pain and begging for mercy. He pretended to be an ordinary normal person. Then the two thugs were leaving. A girl suddenly offered him handkerchief to wipe the wound on his nose. Akira then refused it, the girl walked away. In another place, it turned out to be Kuro, Takeshi's subordinate, who had ordered the two men to beat Akira up. They pretended to be tough, even though their fingers were broken. Kuro reported to his boss that they had beaten Akira. Takeshi wonders why Akira didn't fight back. Is he really the fable? In another place, a normal person would sleep in a room with a soft mattress, but Akira could only sleep in his cold bathtub. Then it switches to two mercenary assassins, Hoodie and Mukai, are attacking a base. They wiped out everyone there. Hoodie has detained the leader. It turns out that these people are corpse cleaners. Hoodie wants to know where he got the cell phone that recorded the fable. These people confessed they were just cleaning the corpse and found the cell phone there. Hoodie wanted the password on this cell phone, but this person refused. Hoodie tortured and forced him. This guy had no choice, he told him the password. When the phone is unlocked, Hoodie kills the guy. Hoodie watched the footage, witnessing the ferocity of the fable in action. Akira's daily routine was watching his favorite comedian, Jekyll Tamioka, on TV. And again, he had a strange habit, late laugh. Yoko woke up because her brother laughed noise. She feels very bored. Then Takeshi comes to the apartment. He sees Akira exercising strangely. He starts the car and invites Akira to come with him. He takes him to the harbor. There was a warehouse, and Kuro and another person were there. Takeshi says the guy is a former member, a former wrestler, but he committed assault, robbery, and rape. He really wanted to finish this guy off. Takeshi ordered, finish him. Akira refused, because his boss forbade Akira to killing in Osaka. Takeshi threatened him. If he still wanted to stay at his place, he had to do this. Akira makes a strange movement in his head, putting on his cloth mask. Takeshi says, the fable can kill anyone in six seconds. Akira also started to attack this person. Only three seconds, Takeshi and Kuro had their guns drawn. He was still alive. Akira must finish him off. Akira grabbed Kuro's gun. Takeshi was angry. Why didn't he finish this guy off? Akira just keeps silent and puts down the gun. He begged to be allowed to stay here without hurting anyone. 
It turned out to be a test from Ebuhara Takeshi, because he wanted to prove Akira really wanted to live peacefully in Osaka. He made sure this dangerous man would not interfere and making problem while in this city. Akira wasn't the least bit afraid. Takeshi finished off the man and told Kuro, from now on Akira Sato will live in Osaka for a year. Don't let anyone bother him. Then they continued eating at the steakhouse. Akira asks if he knows who he is and if Takeshi isn't afraid to test him the same way. Takeshi says that next week one of their members, the boss nephew, will be released from prison. He already considers this person like his younger brother. Takeshi was just making sure that if this person bothered Akira, Akira wouldn't touch him. A man was walking while calling, and he was stabbed by a bicyclist. The bicyclist was Kojima, the man who was stabbed owed him 8 million yen. Before he went to jail, this man apologized to Kojima. He would pay his debt of 6 million yen first. Kojima is interested in the adult magazine on his desk. Isn't this girl Misaki who helped Akira? Kojima was interested in asking who she was. Then his person told him everything, but Kojima didn't want to know. He wanted that debt paid off today. This person asked for mercy, and then Kojima shot him. On the way home with Teichi, Akira accidentally saw the girl who helped him last night. It was that Takeshi knew this girl. Her name is Chimizu Misaki. This girl works day and night for her sick mother. If he's interested in her, don't approach her. That girl is not suitable for someone like him. Teichi also told him to work like a normal person, and Akira followed Teichi's advice. He started applying to shops near his home, but with his strange personality, people started rejecting him. They even laugh at Akira's hobby of watching J. Cole Tamioka. Accidentally, he met Shimizu Misaki. Shimizu Misaki asked, weren't you the one who crying about being beaten up yesterday? Akira then confirmed it. This girl saw the application letter in Akira's hand. Akira wanted to go to the florist shop. Misaki happened to know the place. They ran hand in hand. She found out that Akira had just moved to Osaka and had experience in delivering goods. This girl said maybe Akira could work at her place. At a garbage dump. This is where the Maguro gangsters dispose of their victims and enemies. This man named Sanagawa, who is the manager. And then one of the higher-ups in Maguro's group reported that Kojima was free. Sanagawa became a high-ranking official because Kojima used to go to prison. He really hates Kojima just because he has a relationship with the chairman and really liked by director Takeshi. Sanagawa is so arbitrary, they will devise a plan to get rid of Kojima. Otherwise, his position could be jeopardized or replaced. Sanagawa already intended to one day will eliminate Ebuhara Takeshi and leader Hamada. The Meguro group would be in his hand. His men informed him that he had heard rumors of paid assassins protecting Takeshi and Hamada. Sanagawa is having second thoughts. Scene then move. This is where Misaki works, a small freelance design company. The manager was named Matsu. He read Akira's resume. This person also liked Jeko Tomioka. He laughed happily and immediately accepted Akira. Akira's job was to send their printouts to clients, and he was paid only 800 yen per hour. Akira was fine with that. Meanwhile, Boss Hamada gives money and gifts for his nephew's freedom, and Takeshi enters the room. He is very happy that Kojima is free and hugs him. Those eight years must have been tough. Kojima walked out of the room and met his old rival, Sanagawa. Of course, the two men got into a fight. Kojima threatened Sanagawa to be careful with his position. The atmosphere immediately became heated and intense. Takeshi told them to stop and get back to work. Sanagawa was very upset. Akira began his daily tax, that is delivering all the design prints by bicycle. Matsu invited all the employees to welcome Akira. They had a small drinking party. A bespectacled man named Seiji secretly filmed Misaki's thighs. Akira accidentally saw it. He then dropped the camera. There, Akira also finds out that Misaki works at a pub at night to make extra money to pay for her mother's medical treatment. After that, Akira returned home. He apparently kept his dagger in the milk box. He thought of his childhood. He used this dagger to survive in the forest. He could only eat insects and plants.
He was deliberately left in the forest by his boss, as well as his master, to find his own way home. That day, his boss caught a traitor to their organization. Then his boss told Akira to watch with his gun. But this bound person secretly untied him. This person was very afraid of the boss. When the boss was caught off guard, he called Akira over, to attack him, and grabbed the gun. He told the boss not to move or he'd finish this boy off, and from a young age, Akira had practiced survival. This man didn't live a normal life. That night Misaki called him, asking permission to stay at their apartment, as she had left her keys at the pub. She'd heard Akira had a younger sister. Yoko, who likes to get drunk, makes a fool of Misaki. Her face is stripped off. This is how they get to know each other. Misaki loses and is played by Yoko. These two siblings are strange. Akira goes out to visit Teichi's house. It was there that he met Kojima, who immediately threatened him. Akira introduces himself, but this guy still threatens him and is a tough guy. Kojima drew his knife and called out to Teichi. A guest was looking for him, but there was no answer. Takeshi had collapsed in the bathroom. Akira immediately provided first aid. It turns out that Mr. Takeshi had a heart attack and was taken to the hospital. When he backed consciousness, Kojima asked who the man named Akira Sato was. From his eyes, that person is not an ordinary person. Takeshi replied that he was just a normal person who was his distant relative. Takeshi warned Kojima not to mess around outside. Don't look for trouble with Sunagao. Wait for him to get out of the hospital. Before being arrested, Kojima was a pimp. Takeshi warned him not to try go back to being a pimp. He will find a job for him. Kojima promised and swore thecht he wouldn't get into trouble. The next day at the office, Misaki is at a loss and no have inspiration to create a character drawing for a client. She tries asking Akira. And unexpectedly, Akira is very good at making illustrations and funny characters. Misaki suggested to her boss that Akira could be their new illustrator. Boss Matsu was happy. He would raise his hourly wage to 900 yen per hour. In another place, Kojima didn't listen to Teichi's orders. He intends to become a pimp again, and his target was Misaki. He had investigated her background. When she was young, she used to take sexy pictures for magazines. Kojima would find her a high-class client. They promised that Misaki could pay for her mother's medical treatment. Then Misaki refused, but this man threatened her. He would tell everyone that Misaki used to be an adult model. She would be dismissed from all her jobs. Kojima gives her a business card. He'll wait for her call. Long story short, Kuro reports to his boss who is still sick. Kojima disobeys his orders. He tries to become a pimp and looks for girl victims. Then, Sanagawa also gathered many people to become his men. At the bar, Yoko is bored looking for a handsome drinking buddy. She accidentally saw Hori and Mukai, who then flirted with her. This girl was suspicious. The two men were not ordinary men, smelling the same as her brother, as Hitman. It turned out that Hori and Mukai were asked to come to Osaka by someone who wanted to hire their services. It was Sanagawa. This person stated his intention. He would take over Meguro's organization, but there were rumors from his men that his boss had a great mercenary assassin. Hudi is certainly interested. Maybe that person is the fable. Kojima began his plan. He attacked the manager of the pub where Misaki worked. This girl was told by her colleague that their pub was closed today. The boss was injured by two people. Misaki knew who it was. Then she called Kojima. He must have attacked the manager. Misaki wouldn't do such a disgusting job. Kojima said he would wait for Misaki to change her mind. This girl was in a dilemma, dealing with a dangerous gangster. Kojima even sent pictures of her mother. He had to work with her as soon as possible. The next day, Misaki walked into the office with a worried face. Her boss asks what's wrong. She pretends to be cheerful, and that the illustrations made by Akira are so good, they'll use them. Again, the pervert CG put surveillance cameras everywhere. The cameras were caught by Akira. Misaki thanked Akira for the pictures he made. It helped her a lot. Misaki invited him to dinner after work. Akira had never eaten with a girl in his life. He was also confused about the right way to eat. 
Misaki was touched when she heard Akira's story about him surviving as a child. He would eat anything in the forest. He didn't even know what was good to eat or not. Finally, seeing this girl with a different sad look on her face, Akira asked what was wrong, but the girl couldn't tell him. Then they went home. Akira promised that when he got his next paycheck, he would treat her. He would make new illustrations again to make his work easier. Misaki thanked him again, but the girl was having trouble at home. Kojima was waiting for her. He immediately dragged the girl away. His plan was to make sexy pictures of Misaki and sell them to rich people. Kojima gave her a contract for one year. Everyone will be happy, this guy was laughing like crazy. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door and someone attacked him. While Akira was at home, someone called him downstairs and it was B director Takeshi who had forced himself out of the hospital. He was worried about Kojima. Kojima doesn't answer his phone. He wants Akira to check out his apartment. Akira refuses, Takeshi pleads, he'll give Akira his car. Akira was no choice to do it again. He drove the car. Akira arrived at Kojima's apartment and checked the place and he found out what happened there. Kojima was beaten by Mukai and Hoodie, this guy couldn't fight back. Then Hoodie also took Misaki, that who was there. Akira found the old magazine. He learned about Misaki's past, which made him angry. Akira called Takeshi and told him his findings. Kojima was kidnapped, does he know who did it? They took Kojima to an old garbage processing plant. The culprit behind all this is certainly Sanagawa. Then he praised his men. Misaki was already there too. Kojima has long been a thorn in Sanagawa's side. He's so annoyed with him that they start beating him up. Kojima still hasn't given up. Sanagawa taunts him and says no one will protect him. Kojima boldly said Takeshi's mercenary assassin would help him. Hoodie and Mukai are interested. Hoodie shows a photo of the fable. Of course, Kojima has never seen him, but he's acting like it's really the assassin, and in soliloquy, are they scared now? But Hoodie and Mukai were very excited. Finally, they found the fable. In other side, Sanagawa told all his men to prepare, and Akira Saito returned home. He still hadn't decided how he was going to act. He was still unsure. His master would be angry if he worked in doing action in Osaka. But Akira had an idea. He would modify his gun so that it missed and didn't kill someone. Yoko also came downstairs to see what her brother was going to do. She reminded him, if he didn't remember what his boss said, if he takes people's lives, they will be in danger. Akira says that Misaki was kidnapped. He will save her. Finally, Yoko also helps him. They will come along to keep an eye on Akira. The two of them work in a workshop to modify guns and bullets, and the boss comes to visiting Ebihara Takeshi in the hospital. Takeshi realizes he's been tied to a bed. Takeshi starts to get scared. This is the man he was so afraid of. The boss is angry. Why did he involve Akira in his business? If Akira gets to kill and slaughter people, he's will next, and the entire Meguro organization will be destroyed. Takeshi was more terrified when he saw that person had disappeared again. The boss was very upset. He had worked hard to raise Akira. All of this goes far away and against his plans. He just wanted Akira to experience a normal life, so that he could more easily blend in with ordinary people. Meanwhile, Akira had finished modifying his gun and bullets. Now all the bullets were harmless and would miss the vital points, but Yoko was still worried. Then they arrived at the old factory. Kuro was waiting there and explained that this was a garbage dump run by Sanagawa. Unfortunately, Sanagawa's men are intent on raping Misaki. This guy started forcing this girl, and Akira was already climbing the wall. His skills were crazy. Hoodie and Mukai monitored the CCTV all night. Hoodie was very happy that the fable finally showed up. They prepare, and suddenly Akira is already in the back beating up Sanagawa's men. Misaki is so scared, Akira hears Yoko's voice. Misaki is a sweet girl who was never get violence. Make her laugh with jokes so she won't be afraid. But Akira's silly behavior acted scared her even more. Yoko then scolded him. Hoodie and Mukai got upstairs, but there was no one in the room. And Akira had already broken all the CCTV, told Misaki to follow him, 
then hid her in a hidden corner of the factory. She was to wait there until he returned. Misaki felt it was the voice of a familiar person, Akira's voice. Meanwhile, Kojima was left alone in a dangerous position. He could fall at any moment. Kojima actually became bait. All of Sanagawa's men surrounded the place and prepared to shoot, waiting for the fable to come. Hoodie climbed up. He spoke, welcome to the fable. He's been looking for him for a long time. He'll finish him off and become a legend. This man shouted, and Akira came. Then when Akira came, he was shot at. Then he took cover behind a metal door. Everyone was out of bullets, and Akira took them all out with the weapons he had modified. Akira even could save Kojima, who has fallen. Yoko yells on the radio if Akira is okay. Akira pulls Kojima. If he still wants to live, follow him. Sanagawa was already in front of the CCTV, giving orders to his members, where the fable was located. Everyone searched and chased. They didn't find it. Misaki, who was hiding, wanted to get out of there and started moving. Akira and Kojima, not far from there, were also hiding. This person made a mess and dropped the iron, making them discovered. The people who were chasing one after another were taken down by Akira. Finally, Kojima became confident, protected by an assassin as good as the fable. This guy was getting cocky. Akira immediately pulled him and scolded him. They moved again. Akira wanted to finish people off, then he remembering his boss's orders. Then he undid it, but that got him hurt instead. He could only make these people faint, they were too crowded, making it difficult for Akira. Kojima could escape upstairs, and Akira caught up with him. He dragged Kojima. Then Misaki back, got caught, and chased by Mukai. Sanagawa is also there looking for Kojima and starts shooting. An angry Kojima goes after Sanagawa. The two got into a scuffle, because the scuffle was unarmed. Akira let him go, but with his hand badly injured, the two men fought because they hated each other. Finally, Kojima was defeated. Sanagawa got his gun back and wanted to shoot. Then Akira shot the gun in Sanagawa's hand until it discharged. Kojima wanted to finish this guy off, but he ran out of strength and fainted. Meanwhile, Misaki is cornered. Mukai tried to shoot her. He instead played with the girl and told her to run away from him. This guy laughed happily seeing Misaki in danger. Akira was already approaching Mukai but he was ambushed by Hoodie. The two of them made an amazing move. Mukai, who was laughing, was stopped by Yoko. Mukai remembered this girl, the one at the bar yesterday. What Mukai didn't expect that Yoko was just as dangerous as Akira. Then Misaki almost fell and still held on to the broken pipe. Back to the gunfight scene, Akira fights Hoodie. Akira is pressed because his gun fell. He is in trouble, especially since his hand is also badly injured. Hodi taunts him, and Akira takes his gun back. He still sees Misaki's very dangerous state. Hodi appears, and they shoot at each other from close range. Hodi was defeated. Akira immediately moved quickly and saved this girl. Misaki fainted. Finally, everything was done. Misaki woke up from her stupor. She was already in the car and was surprised that there was a masked person next to her. This person opened the mask. It turned out to be Kuro, disguised as the Fable, who was ordered by Akira. The girl got off. She was already at her housing. She didn't want to go home. She then came to Akira and Yoko's apartment. Misaki knew Akira was the one who saved her. She was confused about what to say. Akira gave a picture illustration he had made. It was her character. Misaki was very moved and touched. She owed her life to these two siblings. It was very good, Misaki cried happily. Akira didn't know what to do, look his face is really flat. In other side, Kojima was already in the car, director Takeshi took him out. He would talk to Kojima alone. Kojima apologized for disobeying his orders. Takeshi said he had supported him for a long time, but he was always throwing tantrums. Kojima cried for another chance, and then Takeshi shot him. Kojima can't be nurtured, he must be destroyed. Yoko sees Misaki who is fast asleep, then she think that become an ordinary person, not too bad. Elsewhere, Takeshi asks Akira, are he sure didn't take someone's life in the fight? And Akira didn't answer him. Back to the crime scene, that everyone there still survived. Mukai woke up and then woke Hoodie up too. 
He didn't expect the fable forgive them, and they both laugh happily. Hoodie vowed that next time he would finish off the fable. Suddenly the boss was there, finishing off the two assassins. He took the cell phone that was the source of the problem. Actually, the boss was watching the whole fight all the time. Meanwhile, Takeshi talks to the survivor Sanagawa and shows Kojima's picture. If he acts up again, his fate will be the same as Kojima. At the Octopus Design Company, CG just came to the office. CG saw a photo. He was installing a camera secretly. There was a warning written on the photo. Misaki returned to work as usual. She was very happy, receiving Akira's message. Next payday, Ankara will treat Misaki to dinner. In the end of the movie, Takeshi reported to the leader Hamada, apologizing that he could no longer keep Kojima and Akira Sato from continuing their peaceful life in Osaka. Sequel begin with flashback in four years ago in a nightclub. And then some girls got out and got into a car. The person at the downstairs was part of a pimp group that forced the girls to work. He beat up a girl who resisted and even shot her. This person was part of the pimp group that was eliminated last night. He heard one of his colleagues was shot, and he was also finished off in the park. In the glamorous night city of Tokyo, two men were scared. Some of their members were eliminated. They were also part of a group of pimps who had intended to escape temporarily. But they also met the same fate, even though it was a crowded place. No one was aware. In a parking lot, a man named Kenji Kawahira also received news that their group was disappearing one by one. He immediately got into the car. There was a high school girl sitting in the back named Saba Hanako. She was crying. Then suddenly Kenji suffered the same fate. Unfortunately, when he died, he stepped on the gas and the car moved forward. Then came someone with a mask. He was the fable. He tried to stop this out-of-control car. Akira had trouble and was forced to get in from behind. The car fell down and Akira saved the girl. He left her unconscious on the roof of the car. Hanako woke up from her stupor. Back to the present. A man named Koichi Kawahira or Utsubo, an entrepreneur, teacher, and lecturer, is giving a training on how mothers handle children with physical disabilities. He owns a child protection organization. All the women were focused on listening to him speak. The girl holding the laptop, it was Saba Hinako, the girl who was helped by the fable. Hinako had injured her leg when she fell down a long time ago. Hinako had injured her leg, so she couldn't walk anymore. These parents thanked Mr. Utsubo, as they were greatly helped by his material today. On the outside, Mr. Utsubo is an ordinary person, one who is educated and teaches many people. However, in truth, Utsubo is a person who has a dark business. He would blackmail, eliminate, and take people's lives if they ordered or interfered with his business. The man in front of this, for example, had to be killed according to the client's request. This man asked for mercy, but Utsubo said he was causing too much trouble, spending his parents' money, and making trouble everywhere. Many people hate him. Then Utsubo gave the sign to his men, make this target body was pulled and hung on the expectorator, then buried in the hole. At the Utsubo residence, they welcomed a new member who joined, named Izaki. The long hair man is Suzuki, and the girl is Hinako. Izaki insults Hinako because she's so pretty, but it's shame she's in a wheelchair. This words made Suzuki angry. He considered Hinako as his sister, and told him to shut up. Then Utsubo calmed the atmosphere, hoping that in the future, they could work well together. After the man left, Suzuki asked his boss if the man could be trusted. Utsubo replied that he was just using Azaki. The man was a former employee of the Maguro group, and he had heard rumors that the fable was related to the group. Suzuki thought it was a myth, that the fable was a legend. He heard that the fable never fails, no one survives if they are targeted, and he kills people in six seconds. But Subo denied this, saying that he was the only person who had ever survived from the fable. Suzuki wondered why his boss was looking for the fable. Meanwhile, Akira continues his peaceful life in Osaka and still likes to watch comedian Jekyll Tamioka. And again, he laughs late. At the Octopus Design Office, Boss Matsu compliments Misaki, she's getting prettier with her new haircut. Misaki laughed happily, then CG came in and complimented this girl.
His eyes wandered to her thighs and was immediately surprised by the newly arrived Akira. Akira looked at her. Boss Matsu told Akira to say what was different about Misaki, but Akira complimented her in a different way. He said that Misaki looks like a Brazilian coral snake. The color of her clothes was the same as that. Misaki pouted and was disappointed. She had cut her hair to look prettier, so hoped that Akira would like her. He looks like a model citizen and is very considerate and nice to his employee, Hinako. But this person kept a dark secret. He used Hinako as an appetizer for his lust. The poor girl can only accept her fate. Utsubo is also a teacher by profession. When he was busy, Hinako was often in the garden, trying to exercise her legs. She really wanted to recover and be able to walk again, but this girl often lost hope. She fell and fell again. That's when Akira, who happened to be passing by, saw her. Hinako thought Akira was insulting her and looking down on her. But Akira really intended to help her. The girl refused and told him to leave. Akira instead said that she would be able to walk again, she would recover. Hinako took that as an insult and nonsense, and then left. But Akira felt like he had seen this girl before. At lunchtime, Akira came to his sister's apartment. He wanted to ask his sister something. His sister Yoko had a very good memory. She remembers every list of murders and criminal cases that happened from year to year. Akira asked about the events in December four years ago. Yoko started to mention one by one. When Yoko mentioned December 20th in the Yamato parking lot, then Akira remembered it. He wants details on the victim Kenji Kawahira. He was killed in the neck while sitting in his car. His car lost control and plunged from the fourth floor. Kenji died there. He is charged with prostitution, and strangely, there is an unconscious girl near the crime scene named Saba Hanako. Yoko is shocked that the culprit is her brother. Akira says that all those people are related to the underage prostitution case and the boss who ordered it. Now, Akira is sure that the girl was the same girl he was safe that time. At home, Misaki is still in her head. She thinks she's beautiful, but Akira says that her look like a snake. As it turns out, Seiji is obsessed with Misaki. This person even knows Misaki's past as an adult magazine model. Misaki's past photos are full in his room. He also secretly installed bugging cameras in Misaki's house. The next day at the office, Misaki asked Akira for help with an illustration about Christmas and Santa Claus. To the surprise all of them, Akira had no idea what Christmas was. He said that he had lived in the forest since he was a child, so he didn't know much about it. But he would find out and make a drawing. Almost every day, Hinako tries to exercise her legs. She saw a stranger man again, and Akira scared her. Akira gives her advice on training methods to train her legs, but this girl is suspicious of Akira and leaves him. Hinako returns from the park, and she tells Suzuki there is a strange stalker in the park these days who is always there. Suzuki, as her senior in the team, promised to take care of this. He would get rid of the man. Hinako felt that, although Suzuki was kind to her, she did not trust this person. How did Hinako end up in Yutsubo's hands? She had a difficult time in high school. Both her parents died at the hands of thieves. She was framed by a pimp, told to sell herself, and that's when she accidentally met the fable and survived the accident, but it left her unable to walk again. This was the working method of the Utsubo group. They would wait outside the apartment they were targeting, waiting for the target to be a young woman, and very coincidentally, they met Misaki who had just gotten off work. They both greeted her, gave Misaki their business cards, claimed from a security camera company, they picked up the signal of the bugging cameras secretly installed in this apartment. They asked for permission to check in Misaki's apartment. Misaki was hesitant at first, but the men convinced her. It is free of charge. Utsubo tried to convince again, it's only for a moment. She can be accompanied by security or people she knows. Then Misaki agreed. That morning, Akira returned to the park to see Hinako practice walking, but she wasn't there. Instead, he was approached by a man who immediately accused and threatened him if he stalked her again. Suddenly, a kick goes flying to Akira's face. After that, Akira returns to the office, asked to deliver a printout of brochures to a client. 
Apparently, Isaki and Utsubo could find tracking cameras in Misaki's apartment. They can track the IP of these cameras and find the culprit. Before they use Misaki, they want to drain the money of the person who did this, and the doorbell rang. Turns out, Akira was delivering brochures for Yutsubo's social organization, and apparently Hinako was there. But Subo invited Akira in, and Hinako served tea. Utsubo apologizes, rumor has it that he was kicked by his subordinate. That person considers Hinako his sister. Maybe he was too hard. Utsubo thanked him that he had been worried about Hinako's condition. Hinako also apologized, she had misunderstood. Again, Akira's difficulty drinking this hot tea made Hinako laugh. It turns out that there are also strange people like this. On the way home, Akira even bought a promotional balloon for Jekyll Tamioka, his favorite comedian. Night came, and again this bad guy did something bad to Hinako. Hinako couldn't resist, even though she said that she was on her monthly period. The bad guy didn't care about it. Akira returned to Yoko's apartment. Yoko is amused to see her brother carrying a Jekyll Tomioka balloon. Suddenly, Akira said that he met his target four years ago. He got the task of finishing off six people, but actually he only finished off five. When he was chasing the sixth target, the boss gave orders to stop the operation. And now he met him in this city. This person who calls himself Atsubo. He owns a social organization for children protection. Yoko asks what he smells like. Then Akira replies, he smelled like a demon, a bad person pretending to be good. There was also the girl, Hinako, there and someone who cared about her. That person was professional. Akira felt it was a strange group. Akira was still hesitant to act because of the boss's warning to do not kill people anymore in this city. The next day, Hinako went back to the park and tried practicing the way Akira had suggested, and she succeeded. She looked around to see if Akira was there, but he wasn't. The truth was, Akira's still watching her. He just hiding. In other side, Utsubo's group began its operation. He called Siji's mother, claiming to be a private detective. He wants to meet as soon as possible. Siji and his mother met Utsubo at his office, but Tsubo asked if he knew Misaki Shimizu. Siji admitted that Misaki was his co-worker. He introduced Asaki as the owner of the agency that signed Misaki. The girl will actually debut soon. They check Misaki's house and find surveillance cameras in her house. The mother and son are angry, especially Siji. He doesn't accept being accused of placing the surveillance camera. But the video evidence is already in front of them. Even the footage when Siji installed the camera is also there. They will meet in court, but this is Utsubo's plan. He calmed Siji that the court process was too long and pity for Siji's future if this was exposed. Utsubo wants Siji's mother to pay them 60 million yen in compensation. That night, Seiji screamed crazy and made him very upset and resentful of Misaki. He wanted to finish off this girl. Apparently, Suzuki was watching Siji's house. He reported to his boss that Siji Kinuma was raging in his room. Utsubo didn't want Seiji to be reckless and harm the girl. Better they kidnap him, and most importantly, they must be able to secure 60 million yen. The next day, Seiji came to the office. He was very upset to see Misaki laughing with boss Matsu. And Seiji was already carrying a knife desperate to kill this girl. While trying to stab Misaki, this person was taken down by Akira. Boss Matsu saw the incident. Akira explained that Seiji suddenly wanted to attack him, and boss Matsu confirmed it. This person ran out, and Siji was already caught by Suzuki. Suzuki was surprised to see Akira dodge his shot. Suzuki then reported to his boss that he had taken Seiji, but Akira saw him. Otsubo ordered Suzuki to eliminate the witness. Isaki came to the parking lot, assigned by Suzuki to keep an eye on this guy. Take him to a quiet place. He has a job to do. Suzuki was headed to Octopus Design Office, and Akira intercepted him on the way. He wondered why this Akira wasn't like an ordinary person. This guy wanted to pull a gun, but it was so crowded there. And he also felt that Akira was very dangerous. Akira also approached him, giving him a warning, returned Siji alive. He will give Suzuki until tomorrow, 
otherwise there will be a mess that he can't imagine. 24 hours. Suzuki was silent, and then he realized that this person was the same as him. Akira returned to the office. These two people immediately asked questions. Akira claimed he didn't find Seiji. Boss Matsu told Misaki to report to the police. At that moment, Boss Matsu asked Akira if he had ever taken someone's life. Akira was naturally shocked, but Boss Matsu had a wilder fantasy. He thought that Akira was a former great martial arts fighter. Then one day he defended his lover, leaving his opponent seriously injured. Because he was soft-hearted, he hid his skills and pretended to be an ordinary person. He was a great man. Akira confirmed it, making Boss Matsu tear up and hug him. He wouldn't tell anyone. Seiki was busy concentrating on Seiji, who was fussing and shouting. He was ordered by Suzuki to ask for Akira Seido's address. Seiji didn't know where his house was, but he knew his sister's address because Misaki had stayed there. Seiji told him the address. Seiki told Suzuki it was the dormitory of director Ebihara Takashi, Maguro's director. Suzuki became even more suspicious. Perhaps Akira is the fable. Yoko was busy cooking when she heard the door open. Yoko thought it was Akira. Turns out, it was a stranger pointing a gun. Yoko keep relaxed and asked who he was. Suzuki told her to sit down. If she messed up, he would shoot her and slowly put the gun on the table. Suzuki then asked if she was the fable's sister. Yoko pretended not to understand. Suzuki mocked her, she was too calm, and he knew this apartment belonged to Maguro's company. She also had the same scent as her brother. Yoko spoke coldly, she underestimated him. Coming in alone and putting the gun on the table. Suzuki was furious, just take it if you can, and this guy lost quickly. Suzuki still wasn't scared, taunting Yoko, he'd never killed anyone, he wouldn't dare to shoot her. But Suzuki wanted to prove the legend of the fable who could kill people in six seconds. Yoko then smiled, threw away the bullets, and put down the gun. She was also the same as her brother, she would prove, and it was very fast. This person fainted. Yoko looked at her timer, it was eight seconds. Two seconds slower, she was annoyed. Back to Azaki. He had the urge to relieve himself, but he didn't lock the car door. Make Seiji escaped. This person returned to the car, seeing Seiji was no longer there. This person carelessly ran the car and crashed Seiji, who was hiding under the car. Until this young man died. Later that night, Akira came to Yoko's apartment. He had expected Suzuki to come here. Akira casually sat down and asked why he was here. Suzuki replied that he didn't expect to be beaten up by his sister. Akira honestly said he was 100 times better than his sister. Yoko was upset. Suzuki didn't expect him to be the fable. Akira told him not to say much or he would be finished here. Right now, Akira was just asking to free Seiji alive, but Asaki, who Suzuki called, was burying Seiji Kenuma. This person answered stammeringly, there was an accident, Seiji died. What should he do? Akira said it was a pity. Suzuki became even more frightened when Akira grabbed his knife. He was ready to leave the world, which was unexpected. Instead, he was released, and Akira even told him to leave if he wanted to. Akira also asked Suzuki if he want to eat first before leaving. The professional assassin's pride had completely vanished. Suzuki, who want to leave, asked Akira why he was released, but Akira just only silent. Long short story, Suzuki was already in his office again. Otsubo came in, asking why he was injured. Isaki had accidentally killed Seiji, and he had gotten rid of him. Otsubo was upset, his 60 million yen vanished. Suzuki also said, Akira is the fable. Otsubo really didn't expect it. An angry Suzuki pointed his gun. What was Otsubo's next plan? His pride completely gone. He was severely beaten by the fable's younger sister. They even offered him a meal. He was ready to wait for death come, but he was released. If Utsubo doesn't have a good plan, it's better Suzuki to finish him now. Utsubo also explained his reason for chasing the fable four years ago. He ran a prostitution network with six partners, including his brother. 
The last person to be eliminated was his brother, and all of them died. Utsubo couldn't forget this grudge. He is very angry, will finish off the fable with his own hands. This guy was raging. He promised Suzuki he would risk everything to finish this guy off. Suzuki believed they would finish off the fable together. Utsubo will make plans tomorrow, and all the same story will accurate tell to Yoko. It looks like Saba Hinako can't walk because of the accident. That's why she was with Utsubo now. That time, he saw Hinako riding in that person's car. She must have been kidnapped, and they forced her. But Subo did risk it all. He hired tons of pro workers and paid assassins from Tokyo. He will use all his money, because the opponent this time is the Fable. They made a plan and marked the Fable's residence. That morning, Hinako opened the door, intending go to the park for practice. She fell down again, and Akira was already there. She was struggling to get back into the wheelchair. Akira asked permission to touch her leg and check it. Akira was confident that her leg would work again. Apparently, Utsubo had installed a listening device in Hinako's wheelchair. He known about Hinako and Akira's closeness. That night, Hinako talked to Utsubo. She confessed that she knew what they were planning to do to Akira. She begged not to hurt Akira and his sister. She promised never to see Akira again. Utsubo just smiled. Four years ago, the man who was killed in the car when Hinako was in it, the culprit was Akira. And Akira was also the one who killed her parents when her house was broken into by robbers. Hinako imagined the events of that sad past. That day, at Utsubo's office, the apartment was indeed being renovated, and Hinako went to see him. She asked for a gun, also she wanted to shoot and take her own revenge. Utsubo said it was just a gun, no bullets yet. He will give it to her later. Suzuki is also preparing to assemble the gun. Akira is at Yoko's apartment, and he receives a call from Utsubo. Akira said his real name. This guy laughed, he was also going to change his nickname, The Fable. He wanted to talk about Hinako. Utsubo knows why he approached the girl. He felt guilty about the past. The legendary assassin had feelings like that. He asked Akira to come to his office in an hour. Akira agreed and wanted to leave. Yoko prevented him. She warning that was a trap. Akira already knew it all, but Yoko intended to go long. She'll keep an eye on him, so he doesn't take anyone's life. Akira got there and talked on the radio with Yoko. This person seemed to have turned off all the CCTV cameras. From the next building, Suzuki had been watching and told the fable had arrived. He is surprised to see Akira making strange movements in his head that he doesn't know about. Akira was changing modes to become the fable. Akira was at the door and opened it. It turned out to be a trap. The place had been set up with a bomb. This little trick certainly didn't work for the fable. Akira fell down. He nimbly climbed back up. Suzuki had no idea this guy was so good. The other residents of the apartment were excited and came out all panicked, except for a little girl who couldn't hear her mother at work. She was busy drawing. Suzuki said they would switch to plan B. The Fable escaped to the sixth floor, ordering squad out to move. The Fable entered a house. These people threw smoke bombs and entered. Utsubo was really prepared. In fact, he hired a sniper. Utsubo also ordered B and C squads to chase the Fable and very many people prepared to chase Akira. One down, all the residents went down and the Fable infiltrated among them. The fisticuffs began. Utsubo ordered his team. The Fable went down to the first floor. Everything to move, this guy called Akira and bait him. There was a deaf little girl living in room 1308. Utsubo had given him a gift. Akira had better get there right away. Akira also contacted Yoko to take out the sniper on the balcony. Utsubo gave orders for everyone to be alert. The fable will return upstairs. Akira began to climb, and people began to chase him. The girl saw a balloon on his porch. Yoko, who wanted to find the sniper, was annoyed, because on the stairs there were people who were lifting furniture. All the residents had started to come down, and one by one, they were all helpless against the fable's speed and ferocity. It turned out that there were still residents who had not come down. Akira jumped out and was awaited by many people. 
Utsubo's men were terrified. Now that Akira was on the 10th floor, he was getting closer to the girl's apartment. The little girl had come out, even wanting to reach the balloon. Akira reached room 1308, wanting to save the girl, but there was no one there. The girl was already in a very dangerous situation, wanting to reach the balloon, and this was the surprise that Utsubo prepared. This person is one of the most expensive assassins Utsubo pays. This person is also very skilled, fist fight in short. While fighting from another building, a sniper tried to shot the fable. Fortunately, his shot was missed. Then they were thrown out. This person grabbed Akira and held him. The sniper tried to take aim, but he was taken out by Yoko, and whose other one also met the same fate. Yoko says the girl is in danger. Akira is no choice to do something. The hand grenade is released. Make the iron construction foundation begins to collapse. He asks Yoko to calm down. Everything is under control. When Akira been gauging, Akira then decided shoots the last metal rod, and the construction foundation begins to collapse. After Akira could handle their fight, the little girl is rescued and starts crying. She's scared to see Akira. And for make the girl calm down, Akira is doing something silly. Then the little girl calm down and laugh. As Akira want to go downstairs, the police started to arrive. He sees Suzuki leaving in a car, and then ordering Yoko to follow him. After that, Akira calls Director Takeshi. Apparently, Akira still had time to eat. He asked Kuro to drop him off. In a suburban forest, Utsubo has received reports that all his hired men failed to finish off the fable. He took Hinako there. Here there was a very nice view. He asked Hinako to be patient. Yoko, who was following Suzuki's car, saw the person she was looking for, expecting this person to throw a hand grenade. Yoko jumped out the car, but it turned out to be a trap. She had been held at gunpoint. Otsubo had already prepared her final plan. Suzuki had also tied Yoko to the trees. Hinako asked if it was Akira's sister. Otsubo confirms this woman is his accomplice. Then Utsubo hands a gun to Hinako, telling her to shoot Yoko. Hinako tried shooting her accomplice first. Yoko looked at the girl, and the girl was already loaded the gun. Suzuki disagrees, but Hinako still tried to does this. But it turns out that Hinako instead points the gun at Utsubo and shoots him. Unfortunately, that Utsubo was wearing a bulletproof vest. Hinako want to shoot again, because Hinako had suspected that Utsubo was the perpetrator of her parents' murder. Utsubo even knows how his parents died. The police kept it all secret. Why would he know? He is the culprit. This guy laughed. He was caught and confirmed he was the culprit. Hinako asked why. Hinako apparently used to be trapped in Nutsubo's prostitution circles. That time, Hinak intended to complain to her parents, and this guy killed her parents to make scare her, so that she would have no one and not run away from his business. Hinako was getting angry. Utsubo taunted her again. Hinako shot angrily, but nothing hit. Suddenly, there's a startling sound. It's Kuro being forced to press the car horn. Suzuki panics, the fable is coming, he's alert, while Utsubo provokes Hinako again, recounting the details of how he killed her parents, making Hinako even angrier. Hinako can't contain her emotions, the wheelchair gets in the way. To her surprise, the girl was able to stand up and take a step. She must avenge her parents. Suzuki then yelled, in front of him was a mind bomb prepared for the fable, and Hinako stepped on it. Suzuki told her not to move. Utsubo is upset. It was a trap for the fable. She messed it up. Yoko tells Suzuki to help the girl, but this guy is afraid that the fable will attack him. Utsubo swearing obscenities, insulting Hinako, and make Hinako shoots again. Akira then comes to greet her, and this guy with Suzuki prepared to throw a grenade. The grenade was thrown and exploded. Akira could protect Hinako. Akira asked Suzuki to save Hinako, after knowing Suzuki wasn't that bad. This man also released Yoko. Yoko shoots at Utsubo, and Suzuki runs the excavator according to Akira's instructions. Akira told him to stop. Utsubo is still busy taunting and swearing, but secretly, this guy still has one more grenade. 
Akira encourages Hinako that in six months she'll be walking on those legs. Akira said they only have one chance. He would count from three to one, and they were ready. The mine exploded. Hinako had given up. She was ready for what happened. Memories of her past flashed through her mind, and Hinako survived, and her leg was fine too. But Suba was very disappointed. Suzuki was very happy. Without Akira's speed, Hinako would lost her leg. She was very grateful. Tagutsubo was still unbelievable. Then Kiki provoked this girl and threw his hand grenade. Suddenly, this guy was shot by Suzuki. The grenade hadn't released the trigger yet. This guy was on purpose. He had already chosen to die. Utsubo was buried in a pit and the days of peace returned. At the office, Boss Matsu and Misaki didn't think Seiji had died. Ekura also came to bring the Christmas picture illustration he made. It was Hineko character. Christmas then came. Yoko, of course, got drunk all night. She called her brother, who wasn't there. Akira gets a letter from Hinako, delivered by Suzuki. He asked Akira to burn this letter after reading it. Hinako told him all her feelings. Four years ago, she ran away from home because she was raised by overprotective parents. But that was her biggest mistake. When she was in the car, she was being kidnapped and taken to a brothel. So she never held a grudge against Akira. Even though she had to be trapped by Utsubo, Akira saved her again. She was very grateful to have met Akira. Akira remembered that when they left the forest, Hinako was able to stand on her own two feet. She took one step at a time and approached Akira. The girl whispered her thanks to Akira, and he burned the letter. After that, the sequel of the Fables movies ended.